today's major developing stories here on Prime. The senator and his wife accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars of bribes. A United States senator indicted on charges of corruption. Authorities saying the bribes to New Jersey Senator Robert Menendez had gold bars and cash found stuffed into a jacket. Now Menendez claims that he's the victim as calls by fellow lawmakers rise for him to resign. Plus, nobody asked for this. Nobody knew that this was being adulterated into our supply. An animal sedative is further poisoning drug supplies, and it's exasperating our nation's overdose crisis, the deadly mixture that's ravaging those who use. And microdosing is mommy is present and aware and showing up maybe for the first time ever. Microdosing moms. It's a new trend that some are saying helps to bring relief from the big and little daily stresses of life. What microdosing means and how it's done safely. Good evening, everyone. I'm Juju Chang in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more including a tropical storm forming off the East Coast. Tropical storm Ophelia threatening to bring heavy rain, flash flooding, and winds at nearly 60 miles an hour. Our team is on the ground tracking the path and the timing. Plus, a consumer's worst enemy, surge pricing. Why the byproduct of the app economy is here to stay. And viewing imposter syndrome through a comedic lens, I sit down with author and comedian Arpana Narchurla about bearing it all when it comes to mental health. Our correspondents are fanned across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we begin with the eye-opening indictment against one of the most powerful Democrats in the Senate and the calls by members of his own party to resign. Foreign Relations Chair and New Jersey Senator Robert Menendez has been charged, along with his wife, for allegedly accepting lavish bribes in return for his political favors. Prosecutors released pictures showing stacks of $100 bills recovered from inside a coat embroidered with the senator's name, as well as gold bars they say were used for payment. And the political backlash has already begun. Late today, New Jersey's Democratic governor, Phil Murphy, called for Menendez to immediately resign. And for his part, Menendez is calling it a smear campaign. He has survived a corruption scandal before, but can he survive another one? Here's ABC's senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky. This is the Mercedes Benz. That These are images, prosecutors say, of blatant bribes accepted by one of the Senate's most powerful Democrats, Bob Menendez. Glittering gold bars, a luxury car, and wads of cash stuffed inside a jacket with the senator's name on it. The sweeping federal indictment, which also charges the senator's wife, Nadine, and three New Jersey associates, accuses Menendez, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, of selling state secrets to the government of Egypt. Senator Menendez allegedly provided sensitive, non-public U.S. government information to Egyptian officials and otherwise took steps to secretly aid the government of Egypt. Menendez is also charged with trying to intervene in criminal investigations into two businessmen, including by recommending President Biden nominate a U.S. attorney Menendez believed would look favorably towards one of the cases. The senator and his wife accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars of bribes in exchange for Senator Menendez using his power and influence to protect and to enrich those businessmen. The bribes allegedly include payments toward a mortgage, a Mercedes convertible, and three gold bars. The indictment says upon returning from one trip to Egypt, Menendez performed a web search for how much is one kilo of gold worth. When the FBI searched his home, the indictment says agents found nearly a half million dollars in cash stuffed into envelopes and hidden in clothing, closets, and a safe. Some even found in the senator's embroidered congressional jacket. On his very own website, Menendez says a senator cannot influence matters involving private business or intervene in a criminal case. But we allege that behind the scenes, Senator Menendez was doing those things for certain people. The people who were bribing him and his wife. This is now the second time Menendez has faced federal corruption charges. His first case ended in a mistrial and was later dismissed in 2018. Tonight, the senator and his wife both proclaiming their innocence, Menendez accusing prosecutors of making false claims against him and adding they have misrepresented the normal work of a congressional office. 
And let's get right to Aaron Katursky. And Aaron, we know the senator's first corruption trial ended in a hung jury, and prosecutors say today's charges are completely different and totally unrelated. Completely separate, Juju, but interestingly, as soon as that old case ended in 2018, it was just seven months, prosecutors say, when the corruption began in this new case. He is going to have to resign now. Menendez is as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. New Jersey's Governor Phil Murphy and the state's other top Democrats have called on him to resign. Menendez faces up to 20 years if he's convicted this time, Juju. And we know you'll keep track of it. Thanks, Aaron. And for more on this story, I'd like to welcome John Katko, former Republican congressman from New York and former assistant U.S. attorney. Hey, John. Hi, how are you? I'm okay. We were talking about the fact that you spent 20 years in the U.S. attorney's office. These are some pretty incriminating uh, charges in the indictment, everything from the gold bars to stacks of money. Um, he's calling it a smear campaign, but the optics are not good. Yeah, the best way to combat that type of argument is to look at the facts. And the facts laid out in the indictment are stunning. And when I was doing cases, if I had great facts, laid them out in the indictment. So the first thing the jury hears at the beginning of the trial is going to be the facts. The fact that they have money in his closet with DNA evidence from his co-defendants. They have a car in their garage that was paid for by a co-defendant. They have text messages. They have phone calls. It's a pretty damning uh, uh, recitation of the evidence set forth in the indictment. Absolutely. The gold bars with the serial numbers are quite telling. Yes. Tell us about the seriousness of these charges. We're talking about accepting bribes in exchange for wielding political influence. Well, think about that. He's head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time he's doing this. That is a very powerful and a very important job, one of the most important in, in all of Congress, because you're one of the point person for foreign relations uh, in Washington. And you're misusing that position, that's very bad. And we're talking about Egyptian interests? Yes. Potentially? Uh, potentially Egyptian interests inter intervening and helping other, uh, some Egyptian interests uh, with contractual things they're trying to get accomplished. And yet he has been facing charges before of corruption. In 2018, that case ended in a mistrial um, after the jury failed to reach a verdict on all counts. Could the previous accusation hang over this indictment? Uh, perhaps uh, from an evidentiary standpoint, if he takes a stand and says something contrary to what they know happened before. But uh, the statute of limitations will probably prevent him from resuscitating those charges. But um, it will box him in to some extent uh, about taking the stand without facing cross-examination on these issues. So it's a potential. There's a lot. There's the court of public opinion. There's clearly the criminal federal court. But there's also the, the congressional sort mm -hmm. of uh, authority. You spent time in Congress. Um, and right now he's been asked, he stepped down as chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Chuck Schumer says he deserves his day in court. And yet the governor of New Jersey, his home state, is asking for him to resign. What do you make of all that? Well, Chuck Schumer's got a headache on his stand. Don't forget, the Democrats only have a 51-48 majority or 49 majority in, in the Senate. And so if uh, Menendez is gone and it gets replaced by a Republican, it could change a dynamic in the Senate. So I think the governor of New Jersey is probably smartly saying, look, I'm a Democrat leave now so we can replace and uh, put another Democrat in your place to finish his term. So uh, we'll see how that all shakes out over the next couple of weeks. But like I said, the evidence here that is known to the public is pretty substantial. And that's something I'm not sure they had before. And I, I'm, uh, it's going to be interesting how it all plays out over the next couple of weeks. And the, he's up for a re-election next year, and yet this indictment is a bombshell. It is a bombshell, to say the least, for the Senate and for the American people. Well, John Katko, thank you so much for your time and your insights. Thank you. All right. All right. To our other top story tonight, the sudden tropical storm bearing down on the East Coast and the weekend washout on the horizon. Tonight, tropical storm Ophelia is strengthening as it nears the North Carolina coast with winds of roughly 70 miles an hour. And take a look at lightning flashes inside the storm as it spins towards the coast. The waves already choppy with gusty winds at Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. And tonight... The governors of Virginia and North Carolina have declared a state of emergency. Rob Marciano will have the track in just a moment. But first, Victor Akendo joins us now from Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. And Victor, it is going to be a long 24 hours ahead as this storm ramps up. 
It's looking like it, Juju. Those hurricane watches posted in the Carolinas, a state of emergency here and in Virginia, with Ophelia set to make landfall just north of us tomorrow morning. Here in Wrightsville Beach, we are already feeling the effects. The wind's only getting stronger, gusting near 40 miles per hour. And if you take a look behind me at the pier, the surf, it is dangerous. This rain, it's been relentless all day long, and there is an increased threat of tornadoes. With these strong winds, trees will come down, power outages will go up. Juju, as you said, a long 24 hours ahead with Ophelia making its way up the East Coast. Stay safe, Victor Akendo. Thank you. Now let's get right to Rob Marciano. Rob, time this all out for us. <clears throat> Well, it's pretty close, Juju. I mean, it's about 100 miles off the coast now, and Hurricane Hunter's just now finding it to be near hurricane strength. So these are the kind of storms we really worry about. They ramp up quickly coast to, close to the coast, and people don't have time to prepare. And as you saw, Victor's already, already getting it. All right, there's a satellite picture. You see it getting more organized. Huge wind and precipitation field with this. The track really hasn't changed much. We're going to bring it right across North Carolina during the early morning hours tomorrow uh, as either a strong tropical storm or a hurricane. The winds will begin to wind down relatively quickly, but it'll shoot up towards the, Ch the Chesapeake where we're, we're going to have a problem with storm surge there. Uh, a lot of the coastal rivers, certainly Pamlico Sound. Uh, so maybe life-threatening storm surges in some spots, especially during high tide. All right, timing this out. You saw the wind and the waves there with Victor shot. That's going to continue from Wilmington and Moorhead City up through Nags Head, Ocean City, Maryland. 52 mile per hour winds tomorrow, early tomorrow morning. And then the, the rain shield gets all the way up to D.C., Philly, New York, I-95, really all spreading up through uh, New England. And there's going to be a fair amount of heavy rain with this. Not so, that much wind by the time tomorrow night rolls around, but a lot of rain, two to four inches widespread, maybe a half a foot in some spots. So certainly going to see some inland flooding with this as well. Juju? Thanks, Rob Marciano. He's clearly the eastern seaboard bracing for a battering. And desperate migrants, overwhelmed agents, and an immigration system on the brink. That is the dire situation at our nation's southern border for what has been a month unlike any other. ABC's Matt Rivers continues at the border tonight. Tonight, officials bracing for what could be a record month for border crossings. More than 142,000 migrant encounters reported in the first half of September alone, now on pace to match or surpass previous monthly highs this year. It just keeps growing. Every, every surge gets a little bit bigger. Border communities and shelters push to the limit the influx of migrants overwhelming cities coast to coast. The thousands now arriving have been on the road for weeks. And more are coming. We traveled to one of the most perilous legs of the journey north in Colombia. We met this group praying before beginning the trek through a brutal stretch of jungle called the Darien Gap. There are signs of humanity left behind in the dirt. A pair of jeans, a shoe, a small children's sock. Every migrant we spoke to there trying to make it to the U.S., the vast majority from Venezuela. Like Jose and Maria Torres, carrying their baby boy up the muddy hills. They tell me they are risking it all to give their baby a better future. And Matt Rivers joins us now. Matt, what has the Biden administration done to possibly prep for this kind of scenario? Yeah, Juju, we really haven't seen a surge like this since the Biden administration enacted new enforcement measures back in the spring. They were hoping that that kind of activity would prevent what we're seeing here at the border. Clearly, that's not what's happening here. Border cities like El Paso doing whatever they can to get out in front of all this before thousands more migrants arrive. Juju. Our thanks to you, Matt Rivers. And tonight, there is a looming government shutdown. Funding is set to expire in just nine days. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy sent his members home for a long weekend after far-right members of his party blocked progress. McCarthy is now planning to move separate funding bills next week. Among the consequences of a shutdown, some four million government workers will go unpaid, about half of them military troops and personnel. We turn now to a major expansion of the United Auto Workers strike. After initially striking at only three plants, union members are now walking out of 
38 facilities owned by GM and Stellantis, stretching across 20 states. And there is word now that President Biden will go to Michigan to support the union workers. Here's ABC's Faith Abube in Michigan tonight. Tonight, President Biden announcing he will join auto workers on the picket lines in Michigan next week, just as the union ramps up its pressure on GM and Stellantis. No pun, no pun. The UAW expanding its strike to all 38 parts distribution facilities across 20 states from California to Florida. We will shut down parts distribution until those two companies come to their senses and come to the table with a serious offer. <laughs> A week into the strike, 5,600 more auto workers today walking off jobs critical to the nation's supply of car parts. At this Delantis plant outside Detroit, workers like Brandon Dawson tell me they're staying on the picket lines until there's a fair contract. But he warns consumers could feel the impact of today's walkout. The customer is directly infected right here. Um, you might need some windshield wipers. Um, they're not going to be coming because we pick the parts that get them there. And what do you say to those consumers who may not be able to get their vehicles repairs or get the parts they need? Um, I'm sorry to the consumers. I mean, I know it's not their fault, but it's really corporate greed. They making the money. They can pay us. Auto workers are still pushing all three companies for that 40 percent pay increase over four years. But for now, the union says it's not expanding its strike against Ford, saying talks with the automaker show progress on issues like cost of living increases, profit sharing and job security during layoffs. And Faith Abube joins me now from Wayne, Michigan. Hey, Faith, what's President Biden saying about his plans to join the striking workers next week? Well, Juju, President Biden says he plans to stand in solidarity with these union workers and call for a deal that keeps the auto industry thriving with the union jobs. Not since Teddy Roosevelt invited coal workers to the White House have we seen a president show such support for striking workers. Juju. Thanks, Faith. And now the NTSB continues to investigate Thursday's deadly charter bus crash involving a high school band just outside New York City. Police believe a front tire issue is to blame for the rollover. 18 students and adults remain hospitalized after the bus toppled down an embankment in Orange County, New York, including five students still in critical condition. Two adults, a retired teacher, and the band's director were killed in the accident. Now to the remarkable 911 call after a malfunction on a $100 million fighter jet forced the pilot to eject and parachute into a homeowner's backyard. That homeowner called for an ambulance, with the pilot also jumping on to call to report the missing jet. ABC's Martha Raditz has the details. It was a 911 call like no other between an astonished homeowner the pilot who parachuted into his backyard and a very puzzled emergency dispatcher. How many exactly what happened? I guess we got a pilot at our house and he says he got ejected. So he ejected from the plane. So yeah. we just see if we could get some ambulance, please. I'm sorry, what happened? Uh, we got a pilot in the house and I guess he landed in my backyard. And that Marine Corps pilot who had bailed out of his $100 million stealth fighter jet after it malfunctioned just moments before was standing right next to the homeowner and joined the call. We have a military jet crash. I'm the pilot. We need to get rescue rolling. I'm not sure where the airplane is. It would have crash landed somewhere. I ejected. Okay, I understand, sir. Okay, just to confirm, how many people are hurt? Well, I'm the only one. I'm not sure about my okay. name. The dispatcher apparently unaware she is talking to the actual pilot. How far did he fall? I was at 2,000 feet. Okay, and what caused the fall? Uh, an aircraft failure. The pilot sounding more frustrated as the call goes on. Ma'am, I'm a pilot in the military aircraft and I ejected. Um, so I just rode a parachute down to the ground. Can you please send an ambulance? And the 47-year-old pilot, unaware his aircraft was likely still in the air for what's believed to be at least 10 or 15 minutes. Has there been a report of an airplane crash? I have not seen any. The jet eventually crashing some 60 miles north of where the pilot ejected. Martha Raditz joins me now. Martha, it's just mind-boggling to hear that call. So what's the latest from officials on why it took so long to track down that crashed jet? 
As you know, Juju, it took nearly 28 hours to locate the jet. A Marine Corps official now saying it was a combination of several things, including the jet's stealth design that keeps it flying after ejection and the bad weather. But there are still many unanswered questions about the search and what caused the malfunction in the jet in the first place. Juju? Martha Raddatz, thank you as always. And Costco recalling nearly 50,000 mattresses for possible exposure to mold during manufacturing. The recall includes some Nova Form Comfort Grand and Dream Away mattresses made by FXI. Mold could pose a health risk. The company has so far received more than 500 reports of mold growing on the mattresses they say were made in San Bernardino, California between January 2nd and April 28th. That information can be found on the mattress tag. Customers can, of course, contact FXI to receive either a full refund or a replacement. And still much more to get to here on Prime. An 11-year-old undergoing multiple surgeries after her family says she was attacked. What they say two women said to her before the assault. But next, another sign of the growing overdose crisis in the U.S. A horse tranquilizer is now being added to another powerful drug. And the results have been downright devastating. We take a look at the impact of Trank. Xylazine was originally put into the supply to extend the euphoria and the high feeling for individuals consuming that dope. Nobody asked for this. Nobody knew that this was being adulterated into our supply. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Our nation's overdose crisis is evolving. Xylazine, a horse tranquilizer known on the streets as Trank, is being added to drugs like cocaine, heroin, and fentanyl. People buying the drugs are sometimes unaware of the dangerous mixture that can have deadly results. Our Ashan Singh has the story. It looks like you got like a mobile clinic in the trunk of your car. Wound care nowadays is everywhere. Katie Mowry and Stephanie Clip are not your typical nurses. Day after day, they pack up their supplies and set out to these forgotten streets of the infamous Kensington neighborhood in Philadelphia. Already known as a hotbed of the opioid crisis, many people here inject openly. Now, the area is being ravaged by an insidious drug called xylazine, or trank. 
a cheap and powerful horse tranquilizer approved by the FDA for veterinary use only. But some dealers here and across the country are mixing it into common street drugs like heroin, cocaine, and fentanyl to increase profits, according to the DEA. A powerful drug mixture dubbed the zombie drug is making its way around California. The drug has made its way now to Alabama. Xylazine is creeping into the Twin Cities street drug supply at a rate that's alarming law enforcement. Trank, whether it's smoked, snorted, or injected, can make users appear zombie-like. Some say it's like they're in a trance. They also often develop gruesome wounds on their skin. For Katie and Stephanie, it's like nothing they've ever seen. You popped out of your car to administer treatment. Oh, absolutely. Multiple times, whether it's reversing an overdose. You know, we try and do it all, but you will never feel like it's enough. Disturbing scenes play out here constantly. Just steps away from our interview, a young woman overdoses. Katie springs into action, reviving her with Narcan, and rushing her to a neighborhood outpost called Savage Sisters. Inside, she's still slumped over and nearly unresponsive, likely from Trank. Though today, she's one of the lucky ones who survives. Xylazine was originally put into the supply to extend the euphoria and the high feeling for individuals consuming that dope. Nobody asked for this. Nobody knew that this was being adulterated into our supply. A record 1,276 unintentional overdose deaths happened in Philly in 2021. Xylazine was found in more than a third of them. That's up 39% from the year before. Our overdose response has had to change significantly. Like, we can't just pop Narcan on people now. We have to do lots of rescue breathing because of the train that's coming. So that's going to change the way overdose looks across the country when it becomes infiltrated. I worked in radiology, cardiology, and I also was a drug counselor for five years. I was clean for a while before got stuck in this vortex. <laughs> this is from the tendon damage. You know what I mean? Like, and you know, it'll, it'll just, right, 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 it'll just fall back down. Now, this is a good day, because sometimes I only have pincher fingers. They get extensive. They come all over the entire limb, full forearms, full legs, full, legs, full caps, feet. all of the hands, top. So extensive, extensive wounds, like open and in a dirty environment. It's really challenging. Sarah Laurel heads up Savage Sisters. She once ran on these same streets while she was in the grips of a heroin addiction until she entered recovery six years ago. Then we started noticing wounds. As wounds worsen with infection, they become necrotic and lead to amputation. Some people who use Trank can become trapped in a cycle of darkness, where painful withdrawals send them running back to the drug for relief. Those in recovery say that detox from Trank is exceptionally grueling. Like Jose Castillo, once homeless and battling addiction, he now works with Savage Sisters. My detox was, I can't even describe it because it was to the point where I didn't think I was going to make it through it. The sickness lasts longer and there's no type of medicine they're giving you that's helping it. So it's like, I don't know, it's, it's a whole different ball game. Trank and the horrors it brings is now going beyond the streets of Philadelphia. Trank has been detected in at least 48 states. According to the CDC, overdose deaths involving xylazine were 35 times higher in 2021 than they were in 2018. The White House sounding the alarm, declaring xylazine mixed with illicit fentanyl an emerging threat to the US this past April. While opioids like fentanyl, not Trank, are causing the majority of overdose deaths, Trank makes the drugs it's combined with more deadly, and the numbers point to the greatest increase in xylazine-positive overdose deaths in the South. In rural Greenville, North Carolina. Porch is your so warehouse. The porch is my warehouse. So this was all delivered yesterday. 77-year-old Diane Carden is on a mission that's deeply personal. This is Michael, basically almost from birth um, up until um, when he passed. Mm -hmm. Running Ekum for Change, um, an organization in honor of her son who died of an overdose. It's the only needle exchange in the area 
for hundreds of miles. My son was addicted to heroin. It was really important to me to know what I could do to help him. He helped me to understand that it's not just enough to say, you know, let me get you some help. Where would you like to go? Would you rather do something else? You have to be able to take care of the whole person. What has being able to start Ekam for Change meant for you? Has it helped you heal? Yeah, I think so. I feel like that I'm contributing something to an underserved population here, and at the same time, um, honoring my son. You wrapping up a community over there? Yeah, I'm wrapping up this uh, every day, once a day or twice, and all right. them right here. Diane does much of this work on her own, and out of her own pocket, serving nearly 100 people who use drugs weekly. She says they're alarmed at the trank, creeping into their supply. They're saying, I don't want that mm -hmm. because they're afraid of what the side effects are. If the uh, participants come in and want us to test their drug, we're able to take it, test it, and then send it to UNC so they can tell us exactly what's in it. Yes, sure. that should be perfect. There we go. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, and that box there is, has a few in it. The demand for testing is so great, even neighboring counties send samples here. And they give us this handy dandy tape to wrap around it just to make sure it's good and closed. What we're finding is 20 to 23 percent of what we send in um, does have xylazine in it. We have samples coming from two dozen programs in North Carolina, every corner of the state. Mm -hmm. But we also have uh, samples coming from about 110 programs across the country. Dr. Nabaran Dasgupta, a leading drug researcher, launched the Street Drug Analysis Lab at UNC Chapel Hill in 2020. It's literally like a old school city. They literally have a <laughs> Fort Knox like, for yeah, all the really controlled really. substances. The kids that Diane and her team send get processed here. Yeah, why are these places sending you samples? I mean, the drug supply right now is so variable mm -hmm. that there's a genuine need to know what people are actually taking. Samples of street drugs flooding in from 29 states and counting. In this set of packages, we've got samples that come from Michigan and come from Florida. We work directly with harm reduction programs and health departments who can message the results back and provide the individuals with support services. So this one is expected to be xylazine and the sensations that are being described is that it causes a heavy sedation. This is the instrument and it can separate and identify components in a mixture. It's incredibly sensitive and specific. Results are added to the lab's website daily, keeping states and community groups up to date with the amount of trank on the street. When it comes to sort of this uptake in, in trank, where do you think it goes from here? We already see it showing up with methamphetamine. We see xylazine spreading from the opioids to stimulants, and we expect that will happen more and more. We do know that people are dying with xylazine in their bodies at the time of autopsy. We don't know what a toxic amount of xylazine is. Dr. Desgupta believes the cutting edge effort can help save lives. So all the information we get beforehand is only when it's too late, when people are either arrested or they're dead. And those information systems are too slow for public health. How has Zalzine shifted the landscape so that we are once again behind the curve. I think we were caught flat-footed with xylazines, really impacting how people get medical care and how people recover from addiction. The wounds are, because they're so dramatic looking, a lot of drug treatment centers won't let people in with those wounds. So then you have folks caught in this catch-22, right? While the medical community is still researching the impact Trank has on people, experts like Dr. Dasgupta agree that it's complicating an already dire overdose crisis that's killing more than 100,000 Americans every year. So I've been studying overdose for 20 years. And like every couple of years, I was like, wow, this is as bad as it's going to get, right? And then the overdoses went up another six-fold, seven-fold. As a society, we've had too many empty seats at Thanksgiving. We've had too many people missing from our lives. We have to admit that 100,000 people a year dying is not okay. We need to be open to new solutions or else we're just not gonna get out of this. 
Our thanks to Ashen. Still much more to get to. Coming up, parenting can be a major challenge and some can't do it without a little help. Why so many moms are now turning to magic mushrooms. But next, more companies are using dynamic pricing and there's no end in sight. We take a closer look at what it could be costing you by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I like to think I'm rebel, I'm revolutionary. I like to think I like to bring change. Tupac, Tupac, Tupac Shakur. The Tupac case is simple. There's not going to be anybody charged with his murder because the shooter is dead. This morning, new developments in one of the biggest cold cases in modern pop culture history. Are you kidding me? Thank you very much. Who shot Pac? The murder of Tupac Shakur on the season premiere of Impact, now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. You know, it's a byproduct of the app economy, but surge pricing, also known as dynamic pricing, is here. And the bad news? It's here to stay. Here's a closer look by the numbers. It was actually about 1980 when modern day surge pricing began and you can thank the big airlines who started pushing up prices based on booking and travel times. But it was the 2009 arrival of the ride sharing app Uber that really put surge pricing in the spotlight. It's basic supply and demand but that's a tough sell when it's pouring on New Year's Eve and you're forced to pay up to four times a ride its normal rate. 
Ticketmaster saw an opening to tap into Dynamic Marketplace, and soon tickets to Springsteen hit $4,000 a piece, much to the boss's chagrin. User algorithms and artificial intelligence drive Amazon to change prices every 10 minutes. That's 2.5 million price changes a day. Retail could be the next surge pricing frontier. Walmart is rolling out digital price tags at 500 U.S. stores that they hope will make it easier to change prices on a whim. And forget happy hour, those discount drinks are no more at 800 pubs after Britain's biggest bar owner started increasing the price of a pint when business is booming. My question is, what's next? And how come you never see the other side of the dynamic pricing? Cutting prices. And we have much more ahead here on Prime. Ticketmaster is trying to avoid another battle with music fans, the changes it is now making to discourage resellers for an upcoming tour. And we've all dealt with insecurities, how one comedian is tackling that head on. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The news-making interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take it. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The White House officially launches an initiative to stop gun violence. An 11-year-old is hospitalized after her family says two women attacked her. And the major changes Ticketmaster is making for an upcoming tour. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown.
President Biden today announcing the first ever White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. After every mass shooting, we hear a simple message. The same message all over the country. I've been to every mass shooting. Do something. The office, which will be overseen by Vice President Harris, will have four areas of focus. Speed up implementation of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act and already announced executive actions. Figure out what additional executive actions the president can take. Better coordinate support for communities and individuals impacted by gun violence. And expand partnerships with states and cities working to reduce gun violence. An 11-year-old girl from Chicago is continuing to recover after she was allegedly attacked by two women. The girl had to get emergency surgery on her eye and was preparing for a second surgery this week. She and her mother told WLS that neighbors hosting a Mexican Independence Day celebration used a racial slur against their family and then allegedly attacked the girl when she didn't move her dog out of the way. When she punched me in my nose, I almost blacked out. WLS reports that police said no one was in custody and the incident was being investigated. An investigator with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office accidentally shot herself while at the courthouse. The sheriff's office said the investigator was assisted by a sheriff's deputy and EMS, but was not critically wounded. Officials also said there was never an active threat at the courthouse. A new high-speed rail line launched today between Miami and Orlando. The Brightline train is the first private U.S. passenger railroad in 100 years. It will make the trip between the two cities three and a half hours. The train service already operated between Miami and West Palm Beach. The U.S. men's swimming team made a historic hire for its coach at the upcoming Olympics. Anthony Nesty will become the first black coach to lead the powerhouse swimming team. Nesty is currently the swim coach at the University of Florida. Before that, he became the first black male swimmer to win a gold medal at the 1988 Summer Olympics. The team will be decided at trials in June. Ticketmaster is making adjustments to how it handles ticket sales for major tours. There is massive demand for Olivia Rodrigo's Guts Tour, and fans who were lucky enough to get a code to buy tickets yesterday are noticing a big change. They may have paid for them, but the actual tickets will not be available until just 72 hours before the date of the event, and they will only be available electronically. This move is meant to stop those ridiculously high resale prices that Taylor Swift fans experienced for her Eras Tour, the Guts Tour kicks off in Palm Desert, California in February. In the growing field of psychedelic research, a substance that makes magic mushrooms magic is making big waves. But it's not just scientists who are excited. GMA3 anchor Eva Pilgrim talked to two mothers who say that microdosing magic mushrooms has been a game changer in their daily lives. These are dried magic mushrooms. That's a magic mushroom. This is it. Tracy T is part of a growing trend of mothers turning to microdosing magic mushrooms to find relief from both the big and little stresses of daily life. You know, I get really frustrated when people say to me, oh, well, like, mushrooms are, you know, the mommy's new little helper. That is not what microdosing is. Microdosing is mommy is present and aware and showing up maybe for the first time ever. In Colorado, where Tracy lives, using mushrooms just became legal in July. How do you microdose? I actually really find that I like to drink my microdose. So you just, you just chew it up and that's it? Uh -huh. Cheers. <laughs> and that's it. That's it. In Oregon, where magic mushrooms have been legal since 2020, Kate Ingram, a counselor and mother of two, has been microdosing for the past few months. I'm not a recreational drug user. I, you know, I drink some wine. <laughs> microdosing is taking an infinitely small amount of the mushroom at a, a teeny tiny microdose. So there isn't any hallucinogenic effect. There isn't any high. So why mushrooms? Because I was hearing amazing stories about people's lives being changed, people's illnesses or their difficulties with anxiety being changed. Both Kate and Tracy say microdosing gives them a sense of clarity and calm. I often describe microdosing as something that frays or like calms the frayed edges around us. And as mothers, we have very, very frayed edges. It's like, oh, that thing that really gets me kind of tense and stressed just isn't. 
It's still against the law to use magic mushrooms in most of the country. Colorado and Oregon are currently the only states in the U.S. where it's legal to use magic mushrooms. Cities in four other states have decriminalized the drug at the local level. Magic mushrooms for healing are not new. Indigenous cultures have been using them and other psychedelics for thousands of years. But the modern science around psychedelics is fairly new. In 2018, the FDA calling psilocybin, the hallucinogenic compound in magic mushrooms, a breakthrough therapy for severe depression. What do you think of the microdosing? We know very little about microdosing. What I do say to people when they ask me, like, should I microdose? <laughs> I say, well, I can't tell you that, but you should know that you're, you're kind of experimenting on yourself. Dr. Woolley is currently researching psilocybin at UC San Francisco. He tells us the studies using the compound for everything from addiction to anxiety have been promising, but all of those trials have used very large therapeutic doses. He thinks more research is still needed when it comes to microdosing. I think that there are risks that we don't totally know, and me and other groups are really trying to understand those. For some, psychedelics may trigger severe psychiatric episodes. Other risks include increased heart rate and blood pressure. Do you think microdosing is dangerous? I think it potentially could be, and healing is a complicated thing. Tracy believes she has found healing, and she's now created an online community to destigmatize and promote the safe use of psychedelics called Moms on Mushrooms. I don't think it's the only way, obviously. <laughs> you know, I think it is a way. It was a way for me. I think I'm a more empathetic mom. Do you feel like it's helping you every day? I do. And whether that's in my mind or that's in the mushroom or both, if it helps me be a better version of myself and still completely myself, it's all good. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim. You know, so many of us can experience self-doubt, have trouble talking about our mental health, or struggle with body image. Our next guest addresses all of those issues through humor. Comedian Aparna Nanchurla is the author of Unreliable Narrator, Me, Myself, and Imposter Syndrome. And she joins us now. Aparna, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You have turned self-doubt into comedy gold. And so I wonder, <laughs> in, in your book and in your specials, you joke about your personal struggles uh, with depression and anxiety using um, self-deprecating humor. Tell us why you chose comedy as a sort of coping mechanism. Yeah, I mean, for me, I was a pretty shy, introverted kid. And I think comedy, when I discovered it, um, uh, as a youngster, it was kind of a way for me to get out of my own head and connect with other people. I lived so much sort of in my own inner world, and I think comedy gave me a way to bridge my brain to other people's. And I think because there is sometimes a lot of anxiety and depression and self-doubt going on in my brain, it also felt more honest to also lead with those things rather than pretend they aren't taking up so much room inside. And yet, despite all of your success with specials on HBO and Netflix and Comedy Central and even late night TV, you say that you still feel like the quote phony, where, where do you think that source of imposter syndrome runs so deeply in you? Yeah, I mean, I'm a kid of immigrants. I think I grew up always uh, kind of trying to play into that assimilationist mentality of wanting to blend in and, you know, draw attention to myself, but in a good way, but not, you know, stick out too much where people are maybe overly scrutinizing you. And I've always just had this feeling that maybe I'm like running to catch up with everyone else in terms of, uh, yeah, just in life. I've been a lifelong late bloomer. And I know growing up as an immigrant myself that sometimes you feel a little bit of an outsider, but how much of your imposter syndrome do you think um, is because of your ethnic identity? I think that's part of it, but I think for me it's several layers deep. Um, yeah, I think it's being maybe a kid of immigrants, a South Asian American woman in, in an art form that maybe doesn't have 
a ton of those, uh, but also being, you know, pretty shy and introverted in a very front facing industry. So I think there's several ways that sometimes make me feel a little bit like a fish out of water. Um, but I really tried to be upfront about those things as I as I've navigated my career. So all of those people who are feeling those lows right now and feeling imposter syndrome, what advice can you give them to help ease the way they see themselves and maybe not give themselves enough credit? Yeah, I mean, I think just the fact that probably a lot of people are are faking it till they make it. So you might feel like you're the only one. And I think a hallmark of imposter syndrome is feeling like, yeah, sure, other people might feel like they not they don't know what they're doing, but I really don't know what I'm doing. Like it's sort of <laughs> you become you become convinced of your own truths. And so how do you cope with what you refer to as internalized racism? This idea that, you know, you're different, but you act, you know, part of the mainstream society. At one point you're quoted as saying, like, I feel sort of white adjacent almost. Yeah, I mean, especially as a South Asian American, sometimes I think my group falls into that model minority. I think Indian Americans, you know, are some of the highest wealth earners in, in the country right now. So I think sometimes there's just this idea that we're all like successful, perfect, you know, high achieving, but that doesn't speak for our whole group. We're not a monolith and we're also three dimensional people. And a lot of us are, you know, maybe struggling under the surface and it's not just this like picture perfect and, and we know that comedy is also a very male-dominated uh, industry. How is that playing into the imposter syndrome? Because I know that a lot of women feel that way in the workplace vis-a-vis -vis their male counterparts. Yeah, I mean, I talk about this a little in my book about just how imposter syndrome is often marketed towards women and minorities as something they might experience or other marginalized groups. But anyone can experience it, but I think it's also important to realize like sometimes it's the water you're swimming in that's the problem and not you being the fraud. Yeah, let's clean up the water, Aparna. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us and for adding your voice to that conversation. Your new book is thank getting grave reviews. Unreliable Nar Narrator, Me, Myself, and Imposter Syndrome is available now wherever books are sold. Thank you, Aparna. Thanks. Thanks, Juju. Thanks for having me. NASA has developed new technology to closely observe the dark side of the moon, which could help lead to its first human colony. It's part of National Geographic's space issue, and we have an exclusive sneak peek showing how far we've come since the first lunar landing decades ago. ABC's Man in Space, Michael Strahan, has the story. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That was 54 years ago, and now this morning, NASA may have just taken one baby step towards the dream of a human colony in space. Scientists now able to get a closer look at the mysterious and unexplored lunar South Pole region, spotting potential landing sites for NASA's planned 2025 Artemis III mission, putting the first woman and person of color on the moon. Initially, we'll be sending four astronauts to the moon, and two of those astronauts will stay in orbit while two go down to the surface of the moon. This is kind of opening the door to possibility to send more people and to stay longer on the surface of the moon. In unprecedented detail, the National Geographic exclusive photo in this month's magazine employed the cutting edge shadow cam, a lunar instrument able to shoot an extremely low light, or in this case, the dark side of the moon. Scientists hopeful to find ice deposits in areas that could potentially support long-term stays on the moon if that ice can provide water. Some of these ices, if they are present in these craters, it could serve as a resource to help us as we explore the rest of the moon and the solar system in general. This is how we learn to survive in space and explore the solar system around us. Our thanks to Michael Strahan. And that's our show for this hour. I'm Juju Chang. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, one woman is facing charges for allegedly killing her husband and then writing a book about grief. Why her brother says he doesn't believe she's capable of committing that crime. And dozens of people are injured after a deadly explosion. Now the details on the desperate search for the missing.
whenever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I like to think I'm rebel, I'm revolutionary. I like to think to bring change. Tupac, Tupac, Tupac Shakur. The Tupac case is simple. There's not going to be anybody charged with his murder because the shooter is dead. This morning, new developments in one of the biggest cold cases in modern pop culture history. Are you kidding me? Thank you very much. Who shot Pac? The murder of Tupac Shakur on the season premiere of Impact, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Juju Chang in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the eye-opening indictment against one of the most powerful Democrats in the Senate, Foreign Relations Chair and New Jersey Governor, sorry, New Jersey Senator, rather, Robert Menendez, has been charged, along with his wife, for allegedly accepting lavish bribes in return for his political favors. Prosecutors released pictures showing stacks of $100 bills recovered from inside a coat embroidered with the senator's name, as well as gold bars they say were used for payment. And the political backlash has already begun. Late today, New Jersey's Democratic governor, Phil Murphy, called for Menendez to immediately resign. For his part, Menendez is calling it a smear campaign. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky leads us off. This is the Mercedes-Benz. These are images, prosecutors say, of blatant bribes accepted by one of the Senate's most powerful Democrats, Bob Menendez. Glittering gold bars, a luxury car, and wads of cash stuffed inside a jacket with the senator's name on it. A sweeping federal indictment, which also charges the senator's wife, Nadine, and three New Jersey associates, accuses Menendez, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, of selling state secrets to the government of Egypt. Senator Menendez allegedly provided sensitive, non-public U.S. government information to Egyptian officials and otherwise took steps to secretly aid the government of Egypt. 
Menendez is also charged with trying to intervene in criminal investigations into two businessmen, including by recommending President Biden nominate a U.S. attorney Menendez believed would look favorably towards one of the cases. The senator and his wife accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars of bribes in exchange for Senator Menendez using his power and influence to protect and to enrich those businessmen. The bribes allegedly include payments toward a mortgage, a Mercedes convertible, and three gold bars. The indictment says upon returning from one trip to Egypt, Menendez performed a web search for how much is one kilo of gold worth. When the FBI searched his home, the indictment says agents found nearly a half million dollars in cash stuffed into envelopes and hidden in clothing, closets, and a safe. Some even found in the senator's embroidered congressional jacket. On his very own website, Menendez says a senator cannot influence matters involving private business or intervene in a criminal case. But we allege that behind the scenes, Senator Menendez was doing those things for certain people. The people who were bribing him and his wife. This is now the second time Menendez has faced federal corruption charges. His first case ended in a mistrial and was later dismissed in 2018. Tonight, the senator and his wife both proclaiming their innocence, Menendez accusing prosecutors of making false claims against him and adding they have misrepresented the normal work of a congressional office. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky. To our other top story tonight, the sudden tropical storm bearing down on the East Coast and the weekend washout on the horizon. Tonight, tropical storm Ophelia is strengthening as it nears the North Carolina coast with winds of roughly 70 miles an hour. And take a look at lightning flashes inside the storm as it spins towards the coast. The waves already choppy with gusty winds at Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. And tonight... The governors of Virginia and North Carolina have declared a state of emergency. Rob Marciano will have the track in just a moment. But first, Victor Akendo joins us now from Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. And Victor, it is going to be a long 24 hours ahead as this storm ramps up. It's looking like it, Juju. Those hurricane watches posted in the Carolinas, a state of emergency here and in Virginia with Ophelia set to make landfall just north of us tomorrow morning. Here in Wrightsville Beach, we are already feeling the effects. The winds only getting stronger, gusting near 40 miles per hour. And if you take a look behind me at the pier, the surf, it is dangerous. This rain, it's been relentless all day long. And there is an increased threat of tornadoes. With these strong winds, trees will come down, power outages will go up. Juju, as you said a long 24 hours ahead with Ophelia making its way up the East Coast. Stay safe, Victor Akendo. Thank you. Now let's get right to Rob Marciano. Rob, time this all out for us. Well, it's pretty close, Juju. I mean, it's about 100 miles off the coast now, and Hurricane Hunter's just now finding it to be near hurricane strength. So these are the kind of storms we really worry about. They ramp up quickly, coast to close to the coast and people don't have time to prepare and as you saw victor's already already getting it all right there's a satellite picture you see getting more organized huge wind and precipitation field with this the track really hasn't changed much we're going to bring it right across north carolina during the early morning hours tomorrow uh, as either a strong tropical storm or a hurricane the winds will begin to wind down relatively quickly but it'll shoot up towards the, Ch the chesapeake where we're going to have a problem with storm surge there uh, a lot of the coastal rivers certainly pamlico sound uh, so maybe life-threatening storm surges in some spots, especially during high tide. All right, timing this out. You saw the wind and the waves there with Victor shot. That's going to continue from Wilmington and Moorhead City up through Nags Head, Ocean City, Maryland. 52 mile per hour winds tomorrow, early tomorrow morning. And then the, the rain shield gets all the way up to D.C., Philly, New York, I-95, really all spreading up through uh, New England. And there's going to be a fair amount of heavy rain with this. Not so, that much wind by the time tomorrow night rolls around, but a lot of rain, two to four inches widespread, maybe a half a foot in some spots. So certainly going to see some inland flooding with this as well. Juju? Thanks, Rob Marciano. East, clearly the eastern seaboard bracing for a battering. And turning to other stories, desperate migrants, overwhelmed agents, and an immigration story on the brink. That's the dire situation at our nation's southern border for what has been like a month unlike any other. ABC's Matt Rivers continues at the border tonight. Tonight, officials bracing for what could be a record month for border crossings. More than 142,000 migrant encounters reported in the first half of September alone, now on pace to match or surpass previous monthly highs this year. It just keeps growing. Every, every surge gets a little bit bigger. 
Border communities and shelters push to the limit the influx of migrants overwhelming cities coast to coast. The thousands now arriving have been on the road for weeks. And more are coming. We traveled to one of the most perilous legs of the journey north in Colombia. We met this group praying before beginning the trek through a brutal stretch of jungle called the Darien Gap. There are signs of humanity left behind in the dirt. A pair of jeans, a shoe, a small children's sock. Every migrant we spoke to there trying to make it to the U.S., the vast majority from Venezuela. Like Jose and Maria Torres, carrying their baby boy up the muddy hills. They tell me they are risking it all to give their baby a better future. Our thanks to Matt. We turn now to a major expansion of the auto workers' strike. After initially striking at only three plants, union members are now walking out of 38 facilities owned by GM and Stellantis, stretching across 20 states. And now there is word that President Biden will go to Michigan to support the union workers. Here's ABC's Faith Abube in Michigan tonight. Tonight, President Biden announcing he will join auto workers on the picket lines in Michigan next week, just as the union ramps up its pressure on GM and Stellantis. No pun, no the UAW expanding its strike to all 38 parts distribution facilities across 20 states from California to Florida. We will shut down parts distribution until those two companies come to their senses and come to the table with a serious offer. <laughs> A week into the strike, 5,600 more auto workers today walking off jobs critical to the nation's supply of car parts. At this Delantis plant outside Detroit, workers like Brandon Dawson tell me they're staying on the picket lines until there's a fair contract. But he warns consumers could feel the impact of today's walkout. The customer is directly infected right here. Um, you might need some windshield wipers. Um, they're not going to be coming because we pick the parts that get them there. And what do you say to those consumers who may not be able to get their vehicles repairs or get the parts they need? Um, I'm sorry to the consumers. I mean, I know it's not their fault, but it's really corporate greed. They making the money. They can pay us. Auto workers are still pushing all three companies for that 40 percent pay increase over four years. But for now, the union says it's not expanding its strike against Ford, saying talks with the automaker show progress on issues like cost of living increases, profit sharing and job security during layoffs. Our thanks to Faith. And now the NTSB is investigating the deadly bus crash just outside New York City with a bus carrying a marching band from Farmingdale High School, rolling about 50 feet down an embankment in Orange County, New York, killing the band's director and a retired teacher. 18 students and adults remain hospitalized. Here's ABC's Gio Benitez. Tonight, the NTSB is on the scene investigating that horrific charter bus crash outside of New York City that left two dead and more than 40 injured. The motor coach departed the travel lane, penetrated a roadside cable barrier, and came to rest on its left side in the median. Officials today saying five students are still hospitalized in critical condition after the bus, which was transporting students from Farmingdale High School on Long Island to a Pennsylvania band camp, tumbled off the highway just after 1 p.m. Thursday. Two adults killed in the crash, including 77-year-old retired teacher Beatrice Ferrari. She was the matriarch of the band camp, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, all the kids loved her. The band's director, 43-year-old Gina Pelletieri, also killed. Her students fondly called her Miss P. I just feel it's like a tremendous loss for all of us. And Gio Benitez joins me now. Hey, Gio, what's the latest on what may have caused this crash? Well, Juju, tonight, that is the big question here. What caused that crash? Well, police believe that there was a failure of the front left tire, but of course, the NTSB is still investigating that. They have not confirmed that. It's going to take some time, but no doubt that is right now something that they're looking at, that front left tire. Juju? Oh, so tragic. Thanks to you, Gio Benitez. 
And other news we're hearing now from the family of a Utah mother accused of killing her husband and then writing a children's book about grief. But her brother and attorney paint a different picture of her than prosecutors, saying she's a devoted mom who didn't have the means or the motive to murder her husband. ABC's Matt Gutman has more. The family of Corey Richens, accused of fatally poisoning her husband, Eric Richens, and then writing a children's book about grief. I just wanted some story to read to my kids. I couldn't find anything that really, you know, suited them or helped them find comfort and peace. Speaking publicly for the first time. We know Corey's innocent, and all that's going to come out in court. And I think that's going to shock people. Days ago, while searching her cell, guards opening this letter in which prosecutors allege Corey attempted to coach family and friends into giving false testimony on the stand. But Corey's attorney says the letter was marked attorney-client privilege and should never have been opened in the first place. Her brother DJ accusing the jail of misadministering her medication to get her out of the cell. And you say that they have messed up her medication six times? Six times. One time is an accident. Two times is incompetence. Six times is, looks like it's on purpose. Corey Richens and her husband had three boys, a seemingly perfect life near idyllic Park City, Utah. They were generous and spent lavishly. But prosecutors say there were cracks in the relationship. Both sides allege infidelity. And before Eric died, he changed his life insurance beneficiary from Corey to his sister. Corey's family says Eric used drugs and possibly overdosed. The prosecutors say it was Corey who slipped Eric a deadly dose of fentanyl in a Moscow Mule cocktail. They also say she siphoned hundreds of thousands of dollars from Eric. When I got the news that Eric had died, I broke down into tears. He was a good guy. I mean, he lived life to the extreme and, you know, eventually it got him. But it's my sister. I knew Eric. She didn't do this. In the hours we spent with DJ this week, he painted a very different picture of his sister. Her and the boys would go to church every Sunday. What is she like as a mom? She's a great mom. Uh, those are the busiest boys you'll ever meet, whether it be soccer, baseball. There's always something. So she's juggling flipping houses, which is a lot of work. That's just a lot of work. Corey Rich and siblings say that just before Eric's death, the couple was doing well. At the time he died, I thought they were probably in the best place they've ever been. Corey told the police that he didn't use drugs to protect his image. Eric's family disputes that. He was a person who uh, took very good care of his health. And uh, so to try to cast the, the, the light on him that we've seen recently is really troubling. It's really, um, it's sad. Our thanks to Matt. Still much more to get to coming up. A groundbreaking astronaut story is being brought to life on the big screen. Jose Hernandez tells us the impact he hopes to make for the next generation. But up next, a major push by thousands to further investigate the death of a popular musician, why fans want his body exhumed. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Oshinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And we're tracking several headlines around the world. One person died and 10 were missing after a fire and an explosion at a golfing equipment factory in southern Taiwan. The person confirmed dead was a firefighter and nearly 100 people were injured and taken to the hospital. Search and rescue operations are still ongoing while the cause of the fire remains unknown, according to authorities. Nigerians marched in several states this week in an outpouring of grief and to press authorities to investigate the death of popular Afrobeats musician Mo Bod, forcing the police to exhume his body for an autopsy. The 27-year-old singer died in a Lagos hospital in unclear circumstances. The late Colombian artist Fernando Botero, known for his sculptures and playful paintings of rotund subjects, was honored at the Colombian Congress ahead of the weekend-long public wake. The body of the artist, who was born in Medellin, arrived in Colombia yesterday after he died in Monaco on September 15. Heralded as South America's answer to Picasso, Botero's works have been featured in exhibitions across the world. Now, he's a North Star for anyone wanting to reach new heights, and now former astronaut Jose Hernandez is hoping the movie about his life inspires the next generation of astronauts, especially young Latinos. ABC's Melissa Adan sat down with the American treasure. The 1972 Apollo 17 mission marked the most recent occasion where humans walked on the moon. It's got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you. Watching from his home in Stockton, one 10-year-old inspired by it. I wanted this for almost 30 years. Ma, ¿por qué sirven las estrellas? This moment, recreated on the screen in Prime Videos a million miles away, was the foundation for Jose Hernandez's big dream. If you could picture a 10-year-old boy kneeling down watching a black and white TV antenna, watching Gene Cernan walk on the moon, I said, man, I want to be like him. His humble beginnings proved the terrain ahead would be tumultuous. Hernandez would travel annually to the farms, then school. By age 10, he was learning English. But what his peers didn't realize is he would one day soar to tremendous heights, a lesson he hopes to share with all Latinos watching at home. Never be afraid to, uh, to dream big. Just put in the work and good things will happen. I always tell people, it's funny how the harder I work, the luckier I get. The NASA astronaut is full of pride during our interview in Los Angeles. His accomplishments are truly out of this world. After earning degrees in engineering and working at the Johnson Space Center, he was chosen to go to space in 2009 as a mission specialist. But getting there meant sacrificing and facing ugly truths, which he faced by following his own North Star. You know, I remember the very first time I felt discriminated at school. I went home and complained to my mom. And my mom said a phrase that I'd never forget. She said, mijo, mátalos con el amor. Kill them with love. And the plain reality is that you do have to work harder to get the same amount of, of credit. And you could do either one of two things. You could put a chip on your shoulder and feel sorry for yourself and say, whoa, he's me, look at me, they're discriminating. Or you can abide by that rule and say, I'm just going to work harder. That tenacity, his superpower, and the key to his success, because his acceptance into the NASA space program didn't come easily. It came after a dozen attempts. Talk about perseverance. This is what I always tell in my motivational talks. I said, when you pick your goal in life, make sure you enjoy the journey along the way, because that's 80, 90% of your time and your effort. 
And if you're not enjoying the journey, chances are you picked the wrong goal for yourself. Yes, I was disappointed, and yes, I sucked for one or two days, but then I propped myself up and I said, hey, look around, Jose. Remember 30 years ago, you were picking cucumbers for 50 cents a bucket? Look where you're at now. So you could turn me down again, but rest assured, I'll be standing here again in a year. A Million Miles Away, which stars Michael Peña, tells Jose's story and one of so many migrant families. We have migrant families coming and they want their children to go to school, but at the same time, they're trying to make a living. And it is very hard. I mean, your parents took a major sacrifice. How do you encourage even other families in, in similar situations? I realize that parents, you know, are trying to put food on the table and they're working long hours. Uh, but I think if they work as a team and, and, and sort of uh, have some type of agreement that there's, there's a way to provide that environment at home. Jose has already beaten the odds by all accounts. Successful career, a master's degree, husband, father of five. But something in him and those around him pointed him straight to the stars. What do they have that you don't have? A boy that was raised picking vegetables in the fields of California, one day becoming the first migrant farm worker to make it to space. He didn't just shoot for the stars, he found himself right among them. And I want to ask you, was it worth it? Being able to see the Earth from a unique perspective, you know, this is a little over 500 people have, have had that privilege out of 7 billion. I mean, this is a privilege bigger than being a president of a country or a NBA or NFL football player. I mean, this is, the odds are a lot harder. Yes, of course it was worth it, absolutely. At this phase of life, Jose says his mission is shifting. For you, I can tell, like you light up when you're saying that you're speaking to schools or engagements or kind of right now talking to youth about specifically getting into STEM careers. Yes. Why is that so important to you? Kids see people, someone that looks like them, you know, brown skin, speaks English with an accent, came from humble beginnings, and I want them to feel empowered and say, if he could do it, why can't I? How inspiring. Our thanks to Melissa. And still to come for us, she spent longer in a shelter than any other pet, but now she's found a family. Why, it took so long for this dog to find a forever home. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. She held a title no dog wants, Humane Society of West Michigan's longest resident. But now a four-year-old pit bull mix named Kimmy Gibbler, who was saved from a dog fighting ring, has found a home to call her own. Reporter Riley Mack from our partner station WZZM has tonight's local lowdown. Kimmy Gibbler is a comeback artist. Catch the ball, come back. Drop the ball, come back. Sitting in her new yard in Lowell, in the final chapter of an epic 
come back. That's kind of the story right there. A story that starts with Zoe Goring. I was there when Kimmy came in, actually. At the Humane Society of West Michigan. She's super resilient. Kimmy was rescued from a dog fighting ring. That face of an angel, scarred by her demons. I don't think humans have treated her the best in the past, but she is so forgiving. Shelter staff say it may be why Kimmy is their longest stay animal in history. She's been there two years. What? No dog deserves that. Until Carol and Jay Sherwood heard her story. She came in like a tornado and she hasn't slowed down since. They just lost their last girl. Molly. No more dogs. We're too old. We're not going to have another dog. When an unexpected new love was found. Well, we, we do that every day, a couple times. I hate to even call her an animal. She's my girl. The reason she was unadoptable. Now the reason she's so adored. With having her home and looking at her, those freckles, she's really cute. <laughs> Finally home with new owners and the dog that owns their hearts. I believe in destiny, and I feel like there were just too many coincidences. It all came together. She's been waiting for somebody just like these two. Kimmy Gibbler, once fighting for her life in the ring, now fighting for more scratches on the couch. She was meant to be here. Congratulations to the entire Kimmy Gibbler family. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Juju Chang. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, and the ABC News app. And of course, on abcnews.com. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I like to think I'm rebel, I'm revolutionary. I like to think like to bring change. Tupac, Tupac. Tupac's a core. The Tupac case is simple. There's not gonna be anybody charged with his murder because the shooter is dead. This morning, new developments in one of the biggest cold cases in modern pop culture history. Are you kidding me? Thank you very much. Who Shot Pac? The Murder of Tupac Shakur on the season premiere of Impact, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern. Every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I like to think I'm a revolutionary. I like to bring change. Tupac Shakur, often referred to as Pac by friends and fans, may seem bigger in death than he was in life. 
He's become a prolific part of pop culture, from our clothes to films about his life. Why the camera's all on me? Why me? Because I'm too popular. Even in music, his imprint still fresh. Look at guys like Rick Ross, bald head, silk shirt. Look at Kendrick Lamar, unapologetically him. Drake has Tupac's ring on right now that he bought at an auction somewhere. I think hip hop doesn't grow without Tupac. But at the time of his death, he wasn't just the biggest rap star out there with hits like California Love. breaking through in films like Juice. Check yourself, Q. You gotta snap some collars and let them know you had to take them out anytime you feel like it. He was a bona fide mainstream celebrity. This is a superstar who is somehow about, about to take a megastar turn. That's very rare. Pac dined with Madonna, went backstage with Mike Tyson, was on red carpets with Rosie Perez. Hey, Rosie. He's to hip hop what James Dean was to rock and roll in the 1950s. And I always thought that Tupac would have been one of the greatest actors ever if he had lived and had been able to fulfill his full potential. But it all came crashing down on September 7th, 1996, when Tupac was fatally shot near the Las Vegas Strip. He's a human being. He was shot by real bullets from a real gun. And we're supposed to sit up and play guessing games with you? Call me when it's solved. For 27 years, Tupac's unsolved murder has cast a shadow over hip hop. His death, just the beginning of a pattern that would become endemic in the industry. It's like, what episode of like bad law and order am I living through right now? I don't even know if true closure actually exists. Justice has been elusive. But could a recent raid finally bring closure? In the last year of his life, Tupac became the face of Death Row Records, an independent record label co-founded by rap icon Dr. Dre and Suge Knight, a former college football player and bodyguard. In the mid-90s, Suge Knight was the scariest guy, not just in hip-hop, but in the music industry, period. On the East Coast, Bad Boy Records CEO Puff Daddy, a notorious B.I.G. with hits like Juicy. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. Something pepper and heavy D up in the limousine. The West Coast and East Coast were pitted against each other in a pressure cooker, all while Tupac's star was only rising. The death row era looms large in our imaginations, but in fact, it was a very short era, and it was awful. September 7, 1996, and it felt like practically all eyes were on Las Vegas. Mike Tyson was set to fight Bruce Seldon in a bout that was billed Liberation. Some of music's biggest stars were here that night to watch the fight, including Tupac. It's over in the first round! Tupac was hyped up when Iron Mike won the fight in under two minutes. An exuberant Pac gave an interview to BET, not knowing it would be his last. Oh, see that? 50 punches, I counted it. Tupac. Shug and their crew walk through the MGM Grand Hotel lobby. There, they encounter Orlando Baby Lane Anderson, who is reportedly a known member of the Southside Compton Crips. Shug reportedly had ties to the rival Bloods gang. There had been a bounty for somebody to grab a death row gold pendant, mm -hmm. and someone two months earlier had grabbed one off of 